involved in the GA from a young age playing underage football. Um, I suppose my earliest memory of it really is, um, I think, going to the uh, league final in 1975. Westport won the Division 1 league final, and I think it was only a nipper at the time, but uh, um, that was my first uh, experience of it. Went to Crow Park in 78 for Mayo in the National League final. I remember being at that. And again, here in, in Westport, I suppose we had the under 13 leagues going, National School League, and uh, where we had, it was an internal league in the club where you had the likes of uh, Town Centre, uh, Murrisk, Ahagower, Casabar Road, uh, and Cahar na Mart, and so on. We were playing together in a round robin competition, and and that that got great interest at the time in developing underage football here in the club. And uh, you know that 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 was my first involvement really at that stage. Yeah, look, listen. I suppose uh, I'm coming to the end of my uh, my my time as chairperson. Uh, five years now is all you're allowed to do. Um, so look, all we can do is really hope that we've left the club in a better position. People will have their own views about that, but um, I think you know we're, we are in a much stronger place. We're moving on to uh, our new development, which I know you'll be talking about later. We've been involved in structures, getting the structures right here in the club, getting our underage to be probably the best underage system in the county. Um, our senior section, as you know, we've, we're striving to win a, a Mo Clare Cup. Uh, that's our ultimate aim. Uh, we've been in the semi-finals in the last two years, so look, I suppose that's what the success will be always uh, gauged on. My earliest uh, memory of Paddy and, and being involved in him, uh, I suppose at the time when I was, uh, I played senior football with Westport when I was 16. I remember in ba against Ballina down in Cross Malina. I think Kevin McSeer was playing at that stage and look, it was a bit uh, overawed by at that stage. But uh, I remember Paddy being at that match and I remember talking to him, talking to my parents afterwards. And lo and behold, I ended up going to Jarlis after that. I think he was maybe a little bit involved in that. Um, but also a minor, the Mayo minor, he was uh, involved in the Mayo minor squad um, and he was chairperson, I think, of, of, of uh, Mayo GEA at that time. So I remember Paddy being involved. Uh, that was my earliest uh, involvement with Paddy. I suppose went on and played at Westport, those different chairpersons. I wouldn't have been too much uh, linking up with Paddy as a young player and I suppose it was in different circles, wouldn't have been in the, the moving and shaking of, uh, of of the administration structures in the GEA until I came in the early 2000s then and I started to get involved with underage um, here and uh, in 2010 um, involved more in the club became chairperson of board and OG and uh, it started to meet Paddy Moore I suppose and his dealings at county board level and uh, even more so when I came in as chairperson uh, Paddy was you know a fountain of knowledge if there was something weighing on your mind, you know, in relation to how, you know, maybe issues in the club and how things should be dealt with, Paddy was a great source to um, sort of to lie on or something to, a person to lean on um, to get that information back because he'd come back and give you some sound advice even at meetings when meetings got a bit rough and maybe heated Paddy was a great man to be at it you wanted Paddy there because he'd calm down everybody and maybe ma get them to see the bigger picture on things um, so you know look again this I know if, if there was an All-Ireland um, final in Mayo Paddy would be a great man to get you the extra few tickets to keep everybody happy and we all know how important that was um, but also here you know even at the club here the developments here you know we have the um, new clubhouse here behind us since 2016 and the AstroTurf here uh, even the skills wall and Paddy was a great source to be able to go to someone, use his connections in the GEA to source that bit of funding or to get, you know, a, a leg inside and uh, so that we could, you know, pull down on those funds. Um, so, you know, even his connection with um, John Prenty in uh, the Connacht GEA was invaluable as well. Um, so look, Paddy, his connections will always be remembered. I miss him badly. Um, but look, this is my last year now, so look, I want to thank Paddy for all that he's done for us here in the club and uh, we'll always remember Paddy fondly. We're down located at the new Westward GEA uh, pitch development. Uh, this was something that we kicked off in the club about three, four years ago. Um, in fact, Paddy was uh, instigated the discussion. Uh, he was looking at the big picture, looking for the future. Uh, the club was bursting at the seams from a, a playing facility perspective and, and he suggested we look at different sites around the, the town 
to expand the playing facilities for the club. So we went through a, a pretty formal process uh, and we ended up selecting this site here. Um, we got planning approval about a year and a half ago. Uh, we went fundraising and uh, we were able to start construction of the new pitch here. And you can hear the, the machinery in the background here uh, looking at putting the finishing touches to the topsoil for the new pitch. When I stand here and I think back to Paddy, you know, I, I feel as if I've known for 20 years, but I actually only owe him about five years. It was after the, the club won the, the All-Ireland Intermediate Championship uh, that I, I got to know Paddy pretty well. Uh, we had some great discussions. He was a real grandfather figure, you know. Uh, but when I started talking to him about the future pitches and future facilities, he gave a marvellous endorsement and support to myself and the team uh, to help just drive the whole thing forward. Uh, and it was important that we got Paddy's approval to do this. Uh, I don't think it would have happened otherwise. So we will have the pitch finished. Um, we would hope we will sow seeds on it before the end of the summer here in the next number of weeks. And we hope to be playing on the new facility uh, next season, probably end of, end of the summer. 23 um, and, but moving on from that we'll build a set of change rooms and we'll build the, the clubhouse uh, probably Lego style and, and phases. He, he was a very happy camper uh, I remember vividly uh, on the site up here um, he'd done the, the sod turning himself turned the spade and he, he was a very happy camper now he was delighted to see progress being made and it was a, a key step in the whole process obviously going forward for the club. You know, the, the Winner House uh, fundraising activities was very much driven by online activities. But Paddy uh, was very uh, uh, accepting and supportive of sitting down to do interviews, even with yourself, Henry, or if you recall, um, in, in the December 21, I think it was, give a fine interview, and it's great to have that uh, for, for, for collection, you know. Now, Paddy uh, Muldoon, to me, even though I said I, I, own, I only know him for four or five years, Paddy's been with the club for, for decades. He's really been a cornerstone of Westbury GEA. He's been intimately involved in the county. He's a county chairman. He was involved at national level um, in Crow Park. But isn't it marvelous to think that he's came back to his home and helped drive the future of the club in the last couple of years. So I'd like to think that um, when we have this facility up and running, um, as, as a new extension to the playing facilities for Westport GEA. The Paddy will be certainly here in spirit um, and has been and will continue to be a very important part of the club. I got to know Paddy Muldoon back in 1976. That was the first year of the Ted Webb Memorial Cup being played. And Paddy would have been chairman of the Mayo Minor Board then and himself and Austin Garvin and a few more lads from around the county would have been in charge of that under 16 team that I was actually on. So I got to know Paddy then and uh, that lasted right up the whole way until uh, last September of course. We would have met on a daily basis uh, and if he was out of the country or I was out of the country on work or holidays or whatever we'd contact each other every day. There'd be a phone call uh, to see what was happening, to see the crack about the football or whatever and discuss the weather and whatever. Uh, so it went on all the time, yeah. Paddy uh, had his finger in a lot of things over his lifetime. Uh, he was involved in greyhounds and uh, travelled to many, many course and meetings around the country and many greyhound tracks. Uh, but there'd be a great connection between GA people and Greyhound people. Well, Paddy was involved with the minor teams, uh, particularly through the 70s. There was uh, two All-Ireland minor winning teams. And uh, as chairman of the county board, which he, a position he held for about 10 years, there would have been minor and under 21 success as well. Um, and after Paddy stepped down as chairman of the county board, he became the central council delegate uh, from Mayo. And he held that position for possibly I would say the best part of 20 years and indeed during that time uh, something rather unique and I don't know if anybody else, uh, I'm open to correction on this, but I don't know if anybody else throughout the country sat on management for three terms during his time as the Central Council Rep. People normally get one or you might get two, but he had three terms on it. Paddy of course was so steeped in the GA, but one thing that was very, very important to him on a Thursday night, 
he'd leave the GA meetings and race to Ahagawa for a game of cards. This had started possibly in the old Muldoon public house and when that closed down it moved up to Kane's public house and there was eight or nine guys there and they played cards religiously every Thursday night. He really really enjoyed that and looked forward to it every week. Yeah of course Paddy is gone now. I, I miss him something terribly uh, and indeed everybody does. Uh, coming up to All Ireland final time of course he was invaluable to us all uh, with, with tickets. But uh, I'll just give you a small story that happened last year. Just a few weeks before he passed away, uh, at that time, uh, Father Charlie in Westport would have had to take over responsibility for Kilmina Parish. So outside the church in Westport, uh, after he had been in Kilmina, uh, Father Charlie took the opportunity to tell Paddy about how he had been down in Kilmina and what wonderful people there were and that they actually had made a lovely presentation to him. So he was telling this story about the presentation and trying to put Paddy in a corner and Paddy let him work away. And when he finished, Paddy just nice and politely said to him, did they give you any tickets? That closed Charlie up completely. No. <laughs> and that's exactly what he said to him, because it was about a fortnight before the Tyrone match. Paddy had been down at the church and then he got bad just after that. And of course, everyone was looking for tickets. Did they give you any tickets? Enough said. <laughs> My first encounter with Paddy Muldoon was in 1960, when he played for a West Mayo team against the Castlebar Mitchells in the county senior final. Now, the Castlebar Mitchells were supposed to have an all-star team at the time, but uh, an amalgamated group from West Mayo, consisting of Ballantoba, Ackill, Brave, uh, Brave and um, Island Eddy, uh, beat them in, in the county final and subsequently they were excluded again because they were too strong from the from from the championship but that was my first encounter with them I was only a young fellow at that time so uh, I didn't come across Paddy again until the he was involved in the administration of the uh, Mayo County Board and I was uh, secretary of the West Board and uh, at that time uh, Paddy was a uh, chairman of the minor board and um, they went on to win uh, in Ireland in 1971. He was the chairman of the minor board at that time and uh, subsequently he progressed from that and went on to become county chairman and I think he served nine years as county chairman and then went on to serve on central council for a total of 22 years and then after that he became a patron of the Mayo GA until his death. So that, they were the, the timelines. Uh, some of the photographs you have there are from London when Joe McDonough was elected president and the other famous one is the one from uh, that was taken out in I believe a Mam Cross at a fair during uh, the 1989 build up to the All Ireland final and the Mayo weren't in it for years and so there was fierce demand for tickets. So Paddy was always had an answer for everybody. So uh, that was the experience of Paddy, but probably one of his greatest attributes was the fact that he was able to negotiate around disputes. He seemed to be able to pull people together when the divide seemed so wide and eventually a solution would be arrived at. But Paddy would be always in the chair chairing those uh, disputes. And that was probably one of his greatest attributes. Everybody thought he was on, on their side. So they'd always come to an agreement in the end. It might take a while, but it, that was one of his great attributes. Of course, I went to Westport CBS uh, and uh, one of the jobs we were given by the Christian Brothers, uh, that would be in the mid-50s, was to come down here picking stones off the field. And then I went to Island Eddy and I didn't return to Westport. Island Eddy being my first club, I returned to Westport in the... 60s, around 63, 64. Yeah, you played for a number of years here at the club. I did. I played up to uh, 1970 when I was honoured with the suspension of 12 months that's <laughs> put an end to the play. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, you, you won a couple of titles as well during your years playing. Well, with Island 80, and I was lucky enough to win out in that very pitch there. Uh, the only county final that was ever played here was played in 1960 
when a Westmere team defeated Castlebar Mitchells shortly after they came from America, which I suppose might be unfair now, though I think they were only five days home. But I was looking to win a county senior medal in that pitch outside there. You know. And then you went into management here at the club. Yeah, I, I, I was after I finished playing and that I got involved with underage here and uh, in the late sixties, early seventies, and then uh, I was manager of the team here at different times. You know, and I was chairman of the club. I say from about sixty five on to seventy one or seventy two. You know. It was a much different club in those days than it is now. And of course, even from a player's point of view, management point of view, there yeah. were tough days or not? Well, it was, diff- it was a completely different thing for the simple reason is that we hadn't this awful schedule of training or anything else. And uh, in lots of cases, if you turned up and you had boots and you might have borrowed a pair of socks, but you had boots, you had every chance of playing. And which did you prefer mostly, the, the playing on the pitch or the managing? Well, uh, it, it, it's, it's very hard to beat playing, you know. It is very hard to beat playing. And, like, I had good days with Island Lady as well because we won a junior championship that time as well. And an awful lot of these people have passed on since. And uh, there was great, the, the playing, it's, you can't beat it, you know, you can't beat it. Management today is a different day's work, though. It's, it's, I, I, I don't know how anybody takes the management of a team. Yeah. And, and even fundraising is much different today than it was oh, in your days. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, we had what was called the Silver Circle. I, don't, I think if you won anything in that, you might have won three or four pounds. But uh, there was money collected and it kept us going. This club, uh, we raffled a heifer one time, or two, or three, and uh, a Charlie heifer, and uh, uh, the man that won her anyhow wasn't half as good as the man that owned her. Uh, when she started going her rounds from marts to churches, you know. Yeah. But it was money, and uh, as I say, there were more difficult times. There were more difficult times. And of course, we must pay a tribute to all those great people that were involved in the GA in those years, yeah. because without them, we wouldn't be where we are today. A- absolute. Like, where we were here in this club here, we had the Kinneys, who, there was three brothers of them, all, all three of them were officers of this club. We had the Hughes family, which is now Carrie Dunn and Port West. And uh, the Hughes family, played a big part in this club in the early years. Some of them interned, grandfather of the present generation for playing football. And the pitch itself, uh, way back during the time, it was known as the rifle range. And you can see why, because they could fire into the hill. And there was cricket played in this pitch by the British Army. And uh, the people that bought it back in 1935 they had a hell of a job to get it developed because there were technical problems and for some reason or other, which might be better not to go into at the present time. Hence, Archeries became a club where is at the bottom of the pitch, where our liberator spoke during that period. And that wasn't by accident that he picked that into the town. You know. And one of the great players at that time was Perty Kelly from Westport. Perty Kelly, yeah. yeah. He won in all Ireland in 36. And uh, he had the Hoban family, Tommy Hoban, who came after him. And, and that. And in 1951, then Joe Stanton of, of uh, Le Canvey, and whose family are in Lewisburg and Le Canvey, he played for Lewisburg, he played for Westport. And I think at some place I read that he played for Kilmina, <laughs> you know. And what do you think, Paddy, was the golden era of football here in West Mayo in, over the decades? Well, as far as this club is concerned, yeah. I really believe the golden era is now. I, I mean, they went to Dublin there with a the team uh, two or three years ago. Yeah, 2017, and, yeah. Yeah, uh, and won an All-Ireland, yeah. which I thought I'd never see. 
and it was one of the great days, one of the great days. There's a lot of young people in the club in Westport now. The uh, older fellas, we, we, we will help out, but there's young, dynamic people in this club who are far-seeing, and they're doing everything to build the club. And one of the things that I must mention at this particular time, Port West, two years ago, uh, decided that they would give a sponsorship here, and they gave six scholarships to people, young people in the club, going to third level education. All six of them have been brought into the Mio Senior Panel in two years. Hence, you have McDonough now playing, uh, uh, young McDonough, and uh, all, all, young Morden, young Lampert, Doyle, every one of them have been brought in. And they have continued this sponsorship. And I think this is one of the great things about the new thinking in clubs. It's new thinking. And they're bringing forward young people. And the board in the here is unbelievable. What does it mean to you to be honorary president of this club? Well, a lot of people would say at my age, at the thing, that it's time I would have passed away. But... I, th I have a, a tremendous love of football. Yeah, yeah you're still very from, passionate. And, from and yeah, at national level as well as... I, I'm, I'm, I'm yes. st yeah. st st mm. still involved at national level in Crow Park insurance and, and at county board level, I'm the honorary patron, and whatever that would mean. But having said that, I, 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 I live and die for fo football. And football has been first all my life. And I suppose... It'll be forced to leg into the coffin, you know. Finally, can I just ask you, Paddy, what's your greatest memory of Gaelic football over the decades? Well, I, my, my father brought me to Crow Park in 1951. I, I'm glad at this age to be able to say I saw Mio win in All Ireland. But there has been great moments since. But, I mean, that's magnificent since... Now, I don't remember the coming home, and I don't remember anything about a curse, and I don't remember <laughs> being brought to the coming home, because I suppose I, I was 10 or 11 years of age at the time, and uh, uh, people that was going to the coming home part of it wouldn't have a 10 or 11-year-old with them, and neither would my father, because he, I suppose they would enjoy what would go on for days and nights after it, you know. But it, it was a great moment. And likewise, the club itself here, the club winning that All-Ireland at Crow Park and uh, going down into the dressing room afterwards, then meeting these fellas. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was in the dressing rooms when involved with my, the minor All-Ireland winners and I was lucky enough to be involved with those with Austin Garvin. Uh, it was great, but your own club winning, you cannot take away from it. I suppose having grown up in a household that, um, having a dad that lived and breathed sport, um, my earliest memories is being in the back of cars, going to football matches um, at the age of maybe five, six, seven years of age, and traveling the length and breadth of the country, um, you know, supporting Mayo, supporting basically underage um, adult teams. And, you know, they were great memories. We were, we were very young kids, I suppose. If it was in 2022 now, we probably wouldn't have been as eager to sit for all these hours in the back of cars when seemingly he was going to meetings after matches. But I think we all knew it was probably maybe uh, when he was involved, maybe with the teams himself directly with the, through the county board, it was probably the after match meal. Um, and we found ourselves sitting in the back of a car with a bag of chips and told to be patient with, with mam. And, you know, it was never an issue. And, you know, they're genuine memories where we were hours and hours and hours left in cars, but absolutely loved it because it meant you got to go to the games. Um, and we didn't care whatever it took, we were going to be at the games. So um, definitely have very, very early memories of the GA uh, since, you know, as I said, I was maybe six or seven years of age. You know, naturally, I've always played sport in school. Um, I played, you know, Gaelic football, every every code practically in school. Um, 
my involvement then, I started playing camogie and I started playing in uh, Nibri Yoga, where they, actually previous to that, I was playing with Castlebar Mitchells. They were one of the first adult teams um, when I was playing. Um, there was a team here in Westport as well for a short time and, you know, at the time it, that disbanded. Uh, then I went on maybe to Castlebar and then um, when Castlebar disbanded as well, unfortunately, because of numbers, I found myself up in the bridge yoga and I was playing there. Actually, believe it or not, I was probably playing there up to about seven years ago, six, seven years ago. Um, and then I suppose Camogie had started here in the club and uh, my dad would have known the then chairperson at the time. She was Alice Lennon. And I remember getting a phone call off Alice um, at work one day where mom and dad had actually gone on holidays. And she rang me and she said, look, your dad gave me your phone number. And he said that there is a few broken hurls and, you know, that mightn't be much good or whatever. But, you know, different hurls in the shed there um, that you might give to us, you know. And uh, so I said, absolutely no problem. And then at the very end of the call, she said, uh, now he did also say, though, that uh, you might give us a hand, you know, if you could call down maybe one evening. So I got off the phone and, of course, I rang dad and I said, like, why are you volunteering me for things? You know, I said, I'm really busy. I'm playing camogie myself. I don't have time for coaching. Um, you know, and he was laughing because I don't know where they were gone, somewhere up the country. But, you know, he just said to me, look, Sinead, he said, it's not a big ask. You know, he said, just go down to the club. He said, give them a hand one evening. He said, you are involved. You play, you play the game yourself. And he said, they're starting up, um, you know, and they need to get things going or whatever. Now, they had been going maybe for a couple of years before that. So he said, go down and give them a hand because they're getting to the older age groups now. So... He knew that I would go down one evening and uh, I wouldn't turn back. So, and like 10 years later now, I'm heavily involved in the club here. We've had a lot of success, really. Uh, it's difficult, you know, when you're a camogie club in Mayo because there are only the, the small number of clubs. Um, when we started with the underage there, there was only in a bridge and Castle Bar. So it is a struggle. It, it is hard work. And particularly in a, in a, in a town and a club where football is, is um, very strong. But we've worked really, really hard um, and we have great coaches and, and, you know, great, great young people who just, you know, will do whatever it takes to, to aspire to be the best Camogie players they, they can be. And, um, yeah, we've had, you know, we'd fail of successes in uh, 2015 and again in uh, 2017. Um, I think probably the 2015 success um, was probably the real springboard. It, you know, for me personally, it was the real springboard because it was that group that, you know, once we won in 2014, that we kind of brought the whole way through to get our first adult team, which just evolved, say, three years ago. We just fielded adult for the first time. So, yeah, he was he was down here at the homecoming in the clubhouse. And actually, this clubhouse wasn't long built. Um, and as a matter of fact, I think there's there's that night we were in the homecoming actually here um, in the clubhouse and there was no pictures on the wall. And someone passed the comment. They said the camogie, you can have the first section. So uh, myself and uh, another couple volunteers, we, we were quick to get a few photos framed and we made sure that we'd get our little space on the wall. Um, but yeah, he was here at the homecoming and it was lovely. You know, it was re really was now. He, he wasn't the type and I suppose we all weren't the type that we'd be sitting praising each other out loud. Um, I think he actually he said something like, you know, something about that you'd have to listen to a lot of at home or some kind of, I don't know, anyway. Um, but look, it, it was lovely. He gave a lovely speech and um, yeah, it was special, it was. The Fail and the Gale, they organised a competition a couple of years ago for, you know, Fail of Memories. And as I said, Fail was really, really important to us here in the Camogie Club. And it was definitely, you know, a springboard to, to what we have now. Um, a really big club with, with a huge membership. And yeah, that's... I was going back through looking for photos to and to create this video and make this video and send it off and I was finding all the old photos and somebody at the time had sent the clip of, of dad talking um, and giving his speech and you know maybe talk about how important it was you know um, the All-Ireland success and so I was actually so glad to have it and I'm very glad to have it now anyway but so I edited a little bit of that into the video and sent it off um, and I'm not saying it was his speech or anything that, that claimed a thousand euro or anything, but uh, look, it, it played a little part at the end, so that's nice. I know Paddy, going back to the early 80s, when I became involved with Mayor County Board, first as Secretary of the Fixtures Committee, and then in 85 I became the County Secretary, and he was the Chairman, and we, uh, we've we been joined at the hip from that day until the day he died, actually. We, yeah. we had a great relationship, we worked lots of projects together, so 
He was, he was some man for one. We're in this fabulous snow here in uh, Bacon. You brought him up to see uh, this fantastic facility. Yeah, I think looking back in the door, I'm absolutely delighted that he got to see it because, again, he was always talking about it. George Golden himself came here for the guts of half a day and he looked around the place and he was absolutely thrilled that it was that I was involved in for a start, that it was in Connacht and that it was a GF facility. He was, he was really, really thrilled and I'm thrilled that he came to see it before he passed away. He didn't think of planning one for Westport by any chance. <laughs> you never knew what was in Petty said, what he was planning under the scenes. He was a good man to hide his cards, all right. Yeah. What would be your fondest memory or greatest memory of Paddy Mondo? I suppose the big thing that I'm absolutely thrilled that happened between me and Paddy was the Wednesday week before he died, he, he'd been on to me to get me to out to the tavern in Morris for a long time. Come on, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go. So he got on to my wife, Mary, and they arranged for us to go on the Wednesday night. And I'm absolutely thrilled now that we had that engagement with himself and Judy and the crack we had in the slagging and pulling the data out of everybody else. I'm absolutely thrilled that that is the greatest memory and that, that, that really will stick with me. I'm thrilled that that happened. And then I suppose I spoke to him 24, less than 24 hours before he died. He, uh, he got an invitation to the box in Crow Park and he didn't like going to the box. He wanted to sit in the back seats as he called them, the Jack Bootman seats in the Oracola and he was on to me on the Saturday before the match there in Ireland to see could I talk to somebody maybe to swap them. Mm -hmm. And I made the phone call straight away and got them swapped for him and rang him to tell him and that was the last conversation we had. At and least that was, was the, the uh, Mayo Tyrone All Ireland. All Ireland fine, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 24 hours later I got a phone call to say he had passed away. I couldn't believe it. He'd be a big loss to the GA in general. Absolutely. Look, he's a big loss to his family, number one, and to the business people of Westport. He, he had a brilliant business. And, but he's, from a GA point of view, he won't be replaced. Nobody had as much knowledge in that head than he had, and uh, he knew how to use it. And even on Censor Council, he was on the GA Management Committee. He really knew what the right thing to do was at all times, and he did that. I first got to know Paddy when he was a very young man. Uh, it was in the late 50s, and he led a delegation to a meeting of the West Mayo GAA board. He wanted to uh, have a club entered in the West Mayo Junior Championship from Ahagaur. And um, he he said he was very eloquent in making his case, I have to say, uh, but he was turned down for the simple reason that most of the players that he'd be calling on in Ahagower were actually playing with Westport. And if they were taken from Westport, if a club was set up in Ahagower and, it, and the players were taken from Westport to play with Ahagower, it would diminish Westport an awful lot. So therefore, it was turned down. He, um, he, he, he played with Island 80. He, was, uh, he won a county junior championship medal with Island 80. I think that was in 1959. And he was also a member of the county minor team that reached the Connacht final. I think it was around that same year. So I remember him well. He was a knacky little footballer, I have to say. He was uh, well able to play, well able to hold his own with anyone. He established a business then, his insurance business in Westport, uh, which was very lucrative business and he was very popular. And of course, then he became a member of the Westport club. And uh, he eventually became chairman of the club. And he, he led them at one stage, he was coach at one stage, I think, and he led them to a county junior championship. I think that was in around 1970. He led them to a county junior championship. And uh, he was chairman himself for about nine years uh, in Westport. But there was always a, an old saying about him that when he was coaching his team or training his team or whatever he was doing with his team, the, the, the one, uh, uh, the one uh, warning he'd give his players was, I have only three subs and I intend to use them. He was also a, a founding member of the Green and Red Trust. And that was an organisation that was established by himself and people like Father Leo Moran and Dr McLoftus. It was established to help players, former players, who were run down on their luck, in other words. And uh, it, uh, it did help a lot of people, a lot of people who did have 
uh, problems after they, they left football. Uh, they were helped by this organisation, which was a good one, you know. I think Johnny Carey was involved in it as well. He was also received the Mayo News Hall of Fame Award. Um, uh, that was given to him at the, the Mayo News um, Annual Sports Awards. Uh, and uh, it was given to him for his loyalty and his dedication, which was, you know, f fabulous. Over some 60 years, I'd say, he was uh, involved in Mayo affairs, you know, and uh, he deserved it, and it was well deserved, and uh, it was well received, that pre presentation that evening. I'm absolutely delighted to be paying tribute to a very, very good friend of mine, Paddy Muldoon, who, who passed away recently. Um, one of the all-time greats in terms of GA administration, I would suggest you, given his record as chairman of the county board, involvement in Connacht Council, involvement at national level as well as a trustee of the organisation, and of course was at one level, I suppose, Mr. Insurance in the GA for so many, so many years. Himself and Cathy Slattery would have so soldiered together for many, many, many a day in that realm. Um, but his unique contribution, I suppose, is that he was president of a club in Ireland and in America, both at the same time. He was president for many years of the Mayo Football Club in New York, as well as being president of the Westport Football Club or Westport GEA Club. Um, a unique standing for a unique man, I would suggest you, and a man who made a huge contribution to the GEA on both sides of the Atlantic. A yesh day around in Dealish. Well, my next guest certainly knows all about championships and <laughs> all sorts of games that he's given de de decades of service to uh, Westport GEA. In fact, going back to the mid-1960s, Paddy Muldoon, the honorary president of the club. You're very, very welcome to the programme, Paddy. Thanks very much, Henry. There's been some water under the bridge and some big changes since you first got involved with Westport here yeah. back in the 60s. We don't like going back so far because uh, there's undertakers and, and parish priests in this parish that should be glad to say it's time to go. But there has been massive changes, massive changes. Uh, originally, this pitch out here was uh, the cricket ground, uh, which was hard to take for some of the people at the particular time, uh, for a lot of the people, I suppose. And uh, to see the massive changes that has come about in a short period of time, really, you know, 50 or 60 years is a short, well, it's easy for me to say that now, but it is a short period of time. And the, the amount of work that has been done by people that has passed and gone here, and uh, who gave their life to keep football alive in bad times, with bad conditions, bad fields, and we're no here. No dressing rooms or anything. No dressing rooms. <laughs> under the bush. <laughs> under the bush. Those were the days, yeah. as to say. And, and all for the better, all these changes. And I know you were the little, as president, yeah. you had yeah. a little bit of concern about taking on a big project like Win a House in Westport 1 and now yeah. Westport 2, uh, house, Win a House in Westport. But looking at the success of the, the first uh, yeah. project. Well, it was frightening at the beginning uh, when Danny McLaughlin took on this. But then, if you were, to, they say, if you want a job done, ask a busy man. And if there was ever a busy man in this club, it's Danny McLaughlin. Mm -hmm. And he has brought us, he has brought us to a different level. Mm -hmm. He actually has brought us to a different level because he doesn't accept failure and he has driven the project. And I think this project will be successful. And, uh, at this particular time as well, I'd like to pay a special tribute to uh, the, the Kenny family, of course. Of course, you knew Jack Kenny over yeah, the years. Well, yes, yeah. when I became chairman of the club here in 1965, Jack Kenny was a very prominent member here. Uh, and one of the first advice he gave me was, don't use a sledgehammer now to break an egg. He gave me a lot more than possibly <laughs> I should have taken, but didn't. Yeah. yeah, but you're still here to tell the story, Paddy, and that's most of the important true. thing. Yeah, that's true. And actually, I must take this opportunity to congratulate you as well. You got a Hall of Fame there uh, two or three years ago on the Mayo Club All Stars uh, Gala night. There, well deserved yeah. indeed. Yeah. Long and long overdue. People would say, "Well done to you for that." Well, it's dangerous because you're getting to an age then that where you might need the parish priest when you get the Hall of Fame. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you have to be careful. Yeah. Well, I know you're looking forward very much to this yeah. new development and to seeing it come to fruition. Yeah, ab ab absolutely. And as I say, it's a tribute to the people 
uh, that has gone before us and that the legacy stays on. And I said this about, and particularly about the Kinney family, where the, we, we were badly divided in this particular area here. We had five different clubs. Uh, we went under the name of five different clubs, but there was eight, eight Kinney brothers, two of them went to America, but there were Jack, Joe, Charlie, and those stay, kept this club alive. And as I said in the previous interview, Difficult that's times. patriotism. Mm. And mm. Pierce said, life springs from death. Mm. And from the graves of patriot men spring living nations. And from Jack Kinney can look down from the top of the road there and say his dream has, has come, come true. Absolutely. On that thanks. note, we leave it, Paddy. Thanks very much. Uh, listen, yeah. thanks very much uh, for joining us. And uh, no doubt we look forward to seeing you down at the official opening of this great new <laughs> development there if it's going to happen in two or three years' time. <laughs> God. I remember um, Paddy and Jackie Gibbets and Dennis used to bring us all to football yeah. match, the three cares. Yeah. So there could be 25 fellas. I remember actually in Jackie's care one time, lying on the ground, Going into check, he said, keep down in case there's any gears. This is back in the, the late 60s, early 70s, we were all underage. So it was. Yeah, 1966 at the time, I remember, the time we um, we won the county on the 60 title, uh, football. And uh, now, you could say the team well, might have been slightly the wrong the wrong age like some of them like but uh, I always remember we played Kinshima in the final now, if we were over age or some of them were we would definitely know there was half the Kinshima team over age yeah. as well yeah. but I, I know I have the photograph at home um, because before we got the photograph taken Paddy said you know for those of you that might be a bit old he said uh, just bow your heads like and said, can't see the picture the was, the 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 was there a caption there was a caption the in the yeah it, it was like that is, I, 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 I had been, been, been shot at yeah, everyone with the heads down. It was only a few was looking straight at the camera, you know. Was was <clears throat> Merton Dunning played on that team, and he was in Jarrett's and he was playing with Jarrett's and he definitely was had uh, to keep the head down because he'd yeah. been in trouble. He shouldn't have been playing at all, I think, at the time. So he shouldn't. Yeah, Sean Langer was a very good underage, under sixteen that year. Like, <laughs> <laughs> with a few more like you know. Uh, yeah, but that time, um, that was my first say time to, to know Paddy. Yeah. And uh, like leaving everything aside, but um, I would st st say, like, and I said that you'd agree with me that I say, only for the likes of Paddy, like that, I, I don't know the club would be half as good as oh, it is now. Oh, you know? no doubt. Because oh, um, at that stage, we had a very good underage structure in the club, and we won, I won so many titles from uh, under 16, minor, under 21, right up until I was, you know, when I was that age group, and yeah. I think every other team after me, yeah. right into the mid, into the 70s. But it was Paddy. And Jackie and Dennis, the rest of three of them, yeah, yeah. the other ones that brought us to all the matches. Yeah. You know? And uh, like I know there was only on the 16 team uh, minor, was. and there was no one, well, on the three one came in 67, I think, yeah. you know, and the junior. But uh, like Paddy looked after everything, and, and, and uh, that alone, that with the jerseys and football, and you know, you, you name it. Um, he was involved with the county board then, um, um, West Board, and I often remember him giving us money himself. To go for something to eat after the match and all that, you know, with Packers and he. he <laughs> well, do we'll be at the side then? We then, you know, and he'd be picking up grass. He'd be eating grass. Do you remember that? He'd be fucking there at the side like, and he'd be eating. And the boys reckon one and he took up a tissue or not a dip, but a, <laughs> a nitro. <laughs> <nitro>. And he <laughs> would. He was that excited, and he'd tell you if he was putting you on as a sub, he'd say, "Go on there now." And so you'd run out to the referee and come on, and the referee would say, who are you coming on for? And you'd have to run off again to ask Paddy, and Paddy would be going off the other end of the field. It was all delaying tactics. So you'd have to go looking for Paddy to ask him who was going yeah, off for you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was a ploy he had, like, you know, huh? to, 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 oh, it was a ploy he had that time, yeah. A lot of people use a sense. He'd say, give me the man, he'd say, in the dressing room. You know, we were only about 14 or 16, you know, whatever on the way. If you're carried off that field after getting your leg broken, he says, and scoring the winning goal, that's the man I want. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> the field. Yeah. We were going to get up on the field. He promoted me at, at minor age here. Um, it was my final year in minor, and um, 
we had played actually here in the West, you know, semi final or something, and probably got hockey. But um, he, Dennis Gallagher was manager of the um, Ackle team or a selector on the, uh, of the Ackle team. And Paddy brought me out after the game, he introduced me to Dennis Gallagher, and he said he's, he's well used to, he's well fit for his place on that minor squad and whatever. And I was brought in the following week. But um, apart from that, um, I uh, I remember Paddy coming into the club and I remember Jackie Gibbons and Dennis Carroll, the three of them as officers, Paddy Chairman, Jackie as Secretary, Dennis as Treasurer. And they started the success that became Westport at underage. Because as Porrick said, they won underage titles one after the other, all the way up to under 21. That used to be a difficult year, a difficult age group. But... Um, the sorrowful thing about it, and there was very, very little employment in Westport for young people. So when they finished school or college or whatever, they either immigrated or they moved to another town to get employment, and we lost an all lot of footballers. But my favourite um, thing with Paddy was we were never short of footballers because he always knew where there was a few fellas that needed a game. This photograph of the 1967 Westport junior team they were beaten in the West Mio final by Ball, I think. The team from left to right, from there uh, at the back, yeah, yeah, we had um, Joe, Joe, Joe John Finn, Finnegan, Joe or John Finnegan, John McGrath. They were both girls in Westport. Sean Lankin, Mick Higgins, Tony Scott, myself, Tommy Reynolds, Pat Reynolds, Merton Morton, Seamus Nee, and John Reynolds in the back row. And on the front row, left to right, Patsy Kelly, Patsy Nyland, Sean Scott, Paulie Boone, Jackie Gibbons, Joe Costello, Eddie Grady, Dennis Carroll, Paddy Muldoon, and um, Paul Cox. That was the team of the day in 1967. Football was Paddy Muldoon's life, and he would have been so proud to see his beloved Westport club make history by winning their first ever Mayo Senior Football title in 2022.